Hi, I'm Adam Porter and this is my top 100 board game mechanisms that I love and 10 that I really don't. And over the last few videos we've been counting down from 100 to 61 and today we're looking at numbers 60 to 51. So let's get stuck in. Number 60 on the list is positional drafting. So what this means is where you have a bunch of cards or tiles laid out in a grid and then we select those cards but we, we can only sort of access them uh, from the edges or by moving a certain piece around the board in order to access them. Um, so you've only got access to certain, certain cards in that display. And in the case of Seven Wonders Duel, for example, when I take a card, it might reveal other cards that then become available, but we weren't sure what they were until that card had been revealed. So maybe some are face up, some are face down. It's a really satisfying way of doing a draft, of, of getting cards into people's hands, because you've, you've got limited choices, which is great, because it means you're not gonna sit there for ages thinking about all these you know, many, many options that are available to you, but you've also got a little bit of um, foresight. You can see what's gonna happen uh, a few turns ahead. So you can kind of plan for, right, well, if I take this card now, maybe the other player will take that one, which might give me access to this one. And of course, those plans can change, but you're often setting up your opponents when you take cards. I mean, it doesn't have to be as complicated as something like Seven Wonders Duel in, with that big grid. A positional draft could be something as simple as the system in Santa Monica, where if I take a card from the bottom row, then the card from the top row slides down and becomes available for the next round. So positional drafting is one really clever way of reducing the number of available choices, but still allowing a little bit of forward planning in your card draft. Number 59 is what I'm calling the Fantasy Realms mechanism. Now, this is, Fantasy Realms is a game where essentially you have a hand of cards and you're always gonna have that same number of cards in your hand, but throughout the game, you're gonna be swapping those cards with cards from the center of the table and cards blind from the top of the deck. And once a certain number of cards have been placed into the center of the table, into essentially the discard pile, then the game ends and we score the cards that you have left in your hand. So you're essentially trying to build the best possible selection of cards that are going to um, combine with each other in all sorts of different ways to give you the best possible scoring potential. This mechanism was elaborated on in Stonemaier Games Red Rising, uh, adding a board and other little um, levers and tables that you could, you could kind of move pieces over to, to, to score points in various different ways. Um, but really, the core mechanism is from Fantasy Realms and it's a really simple, satisfying one. And that mechanism harks back a little further to games like golf, where players have a series of cards on the table face down and then throughout the game they're going to be swapping those cards out to try and get better cards into their display until the game ends. We reveal all of our cards in front of us and we see who's got the best stuff. This game comes up, the golf, that traditional public domain game which you play with a regular pack of playing cards, it comes up frequently in um, published games like Bat Attack Cat has a similar mechanism as well as Omurta and, uh, and the silver, silver bullets, silver coins, silver, I can't remember what they all are, games from Bezier Games, they all use this same system. I really like that system because I think it's really streamlined. Essentially, we have a set of stuff, it's never getting any bigger, all we're doing is swapping stuff out to try and make the best possible selection in front of us and the other players are doing the same. Number 58 is Catch Up Rewards. So there's lots of different catch-up mechanisms in games, and I'm sure we'll be touching on a few more of those as we go down the list. But this is where the players who are behind get some sort of benefit to help to boost them back up again. So for example, in Isle of Sky, if you're behind, you'll be getting additional income, additional money to help you to buy better tiles, to help you to catch up with the other players who are ahead. In the game Quacks of Quedlinburg, if you're behind, you get these little rat tails that you can put into your cauldron that just gives you a, a slight head start. You're further down the track than the other players when they begin, so you're more likely to score the better points and get more currency to buy better stuff. Some people don't like this mechanism because it feels a little bit artificial, essentially, you know, it's just closing that playing field when actually the, the players who are behind are behind because often they haven't played with a great deal of skill. 
um, so people feel it's unfair. But I, I would rather that than people being left out of the game. You know, who wants to realise you're losing a game in the first or second turn and then find that you've got to sit through the rest of the game knowing you're never going to catch up? Well, these mechanisms give you a chance. It's the equivalent of the game Mario Kart, where if you're way out in the front, way out in the lead, you're going to get hit by that nasty blue shell that's going to slow you down. And uh, if you're out in the lead, you're going to get the worst power-ups, whereas the people who are behind are going to be getting great power-ups whenever they drive through those boxes that give you rewards. If you've never played Mario Kart, you won't know what I'm talking about. But, but that sort of catch-up mechanism is, I think it's essential in, a, in, a, in, in any game, really. I was going to say in a light game where, where it doesn't really matter, but perhaps it's even more important that there are ways to catch up in a long, strategic game where you could be sat there for hours, and if you're falling behind, then it's only going to get more and more depressing for you. And we all want every player to have a good time, right? Number 57 is real time. So this is where we don't have turns in a game, where essentially we all just play simultaneously. Usually there's a, a time element to this. So it could be a game like Magic Maze, where we're all playing together and we're trying to um, find the, the, the different treasures and then get out of that shopping mall, but we're all doing it at the same time, rushing to move our pieces around and place the tiles and get to those locations. Or it could be a game like Deja Vu, which is a, a memory game where we're um, where we're trying to spot, have we seen that before? Is this the second time that it's come out of that deck? In which case we grab the piece, but everybody's doing the same activity all at the same time without any turns. Now, I, I really enjoy this mechanism when it works and when it's simple and when I understand what's going on. One of the problems with this mechanism is that you can't really stop and check um, have I understood the rules correctly? Because everybody else is so frantically doing what they're doing that it kind of ruins it if you have to stop and say, oh, sorry, can I just stop and ask this? And I've had that experience before. I remember playing Escaped Curse of the Temple many years ago for the first time and having a, a baffling rules explanation and then being thrown into this real-time thing where I was thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know whether I'm cheating. I don't know whether I'm playing correctly and, and there's nobody I can ask because everybody else is so busy. So I think that's one of the downsides of real time. And I think some people are gonna be turned off by the stress that it creates. Number 56 is roll and write games, but specifically those that use number sequences, which is a lot of them. I recently made a video about how to design a roll and write game, looking at all the different mechanisms used in these games. But number sequences is a big part of it. So in Quix and Quinto and Welcome To, for example, you have to position number and they must go from the smallest number to the highest number as you go sort of along a, a particular row. And there may be other um, limitations. For example, in Quinto, you can't place the same number in the different levels of a column. So in addition to having to place them in numerical order along the row, in some of them, if you put a number down, you can't then put something lower. Uh, once you've put it, you, you, you're kind of stuck with it. In others, you can. You can put lower numbers as long as they're in the right sequence. Um, and I find this... You know, it's simple mathematics, isn't it? It's kind of that, that end of mathematics which is accessible and, you know, feels like problem solving, feels more like a puzzle than, than work. Um, if you go too far down this down that line, the balance tips and it becomes, okay, well now I'm just doing maths, okay, and it becomes a bit of a chore. But I do like simple number sequences in games. I find it satisfying. It, it fires off some of those, those uh, neurons in my brain that maybe I haven't used since school days. Um, and yeah, putting things in sequence, organising things is something that, that appeals, I think, to everybody. The organisation part of your brain. Number 55 is three or four or five in a row, okay? But essentially, it's, it's tic-tac-toe, really, isn't it? Or, or noughts and crosses, is where we're trying to connect up a series of things, but we're blocking each other as we go. Usually an abstract game, but we're trying to, to, to make a chain of adjacent things. It could be the game Connect Four, for example. Um, but the versions that I really enjoy is Quarto, which we'll be coming back to later in this list. Goblet, Goblet, you're trying to make, um, I think it's four in a row, but you're, you're able to place pieces over the top of other pieces, hiding them. And then you can move that piece again later, but when you do, you may forget that there's a piece hiding underneath it. So you might reveal one of your opponent's pieces, which might be just what they need in order to complete their set of four in a row. So this mechanism I find 
I guess it's just familiar. That's why I enjoy it. It harks back to playing, you know, noughts and crosses or tic-tac-toe, um, you know, in the back of a, a school uh, school book, a school exercise book, when I should have been listening to the teacher, you know, scribbling away, playing with a playing with a friend. That's that's my sort of where my fondness and nostalgia for this sort of system comes from. But it, because it's so familiar, it's very accessible to new players. You know, if, if, if you put a game of Quarto or Goblet in front of a new player, they're not gonna be totally lost. In fact, you can see their eyes light up when they go, ah, oh, this is like that game that I knew, but it's better because it's got this, this twist. And the twists are not overbearing in those two games. The twists are, are nice, simple things that just liven the game up a little bit and give it a bit of spice. Number 54 is worker placement. Now, this is quite low on the list, isn't it really? 54. I know worker placement is sort of a favourite mechanism of many, many people, particularly people who like quite large strategy games. So worker placement is where each player has one or more workers, usually more, uh, a bunch of different sort of playing pieces, tokens, and they can place them onto a central board in order to take an action. And that action might be to gather resources, for example. So in Agricola, you'd take the action of placing your worker in order to take wood. Now, what happens there is nobody else can now use that action spot. While I'm sat there, no one else can go there. So I've blocked it off. I've limited their access to that wood. Um, and, and they're gonna have to wait till the next round. And maybe it's gonna take some time for that wood to replenish because in, in Agricola, for example, we're adding resources each round to those spaces. And if you let them build up for a number of turns before anyone takes the action, they get a better reward. But over the years, lots and lots of variations of worker placement have, have, have evolved uh, in, in all sorts of different ways. And no longer is it the case that a worker absolutely blocks a space. Often there's ways around that, whether it's the, the grande worker in viticulture who can kind of break the rules and, and, and sneak in there, or the, the, white, um, the white pawns that you get in, in dominant species marine that have their own special worker placement um, uh, spots where they can access better versions of, of the actions than anybody else. In, in dominant species marine, you can only place workers further down the chart than your previous workers. So, so it, it functions a little bit like a rondelle, really. If you're gonna take one of the actions at the top of that table, then you better do that early in the round, because if you take a lower action, you're not going back up to that top until you've placed all your pawns and retrieved them. So worker placement has proven itself to be a really versatile system for large strategic games. It's something that confuses a lot of people, uh, newcomers into the hobby, because it's jargon, essentially. Um, people think, well, if I'm you know, in a carcass on it, I'm placing a, uh, one of my little person tokens. I mean, reasonably, you could call that a worker, and I'm placing onto a tile. Well, I'm placing a worker, therefore it's a worker placement game. And that's not the case. It's, it's one of those um, annoying bits of jargon that gamers use where we say, no, no, you're wrong. You might be placing a worker, but it's not worker placement. Um, and I suppose specificity in these mechanisms is, is really essential, particularly if you're, you're a designer. Um, you, you've got to be thinking about, right, well, you know, what is this mechanism that I'm using? What other games utilize that? So it's useful to have some sort of classifying system, but I'm not sure the term is particularly helpful. It's actually a subsection of a previous category that I've mentioned already in my top 100, which is action selection. Perhaps worker placement is just the most famous version of action selection that we have in the hobby right now. Number 53 is hidden movement. And I've not found too many games that I really like with hidden movement. The one that I really, really enjoy is Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard was one of my favorite games, probably my favorite game as a child. So it's been around for a long time. It was a Spiel des Jahres winner all the way back then. And amongst all the games of Monopoly and Cluedo and everything else that I was playing, the mass market games, um, there was Scotland Yard, this German game. And I didn't realize at the time that this was something different. This was an early version of a sort of Euro game, really. It, was, it had a different aesthetic, it had more strategy, and it was just that bit more satisfying. But I'm really glad that I could even recognize, without knowing that stuff, without knowing that it came from a different sort of ancestry or a different, um, a different background to, to, to the, 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 the Mattel and MB and, and, and Hasbro games at the time, um, I, I still recognized the quality in it. So I'm glad that, you know, looking back and seeing that a child 
can see through all that stuff and see where there is quality, sophisticated design. And I don't think Scotland Yard has ever been bettered. You know, games like Fury of Dracula and um, Letters from Whitechapel, um, I feel they complicate the game, I feel they extend the time unnecessarily, um, whereas Scotland Yard is very simple, um, quick to play, and really satisfying. You're chasing Mr. X around a map of London and you can see what modes of transport he's using but you don't know what location he's at. But every now and then he reveals himself and you think well okay right he was at that location but since then he's used a taxi and a bus and an underground and, and so maybe he's here and the other players all work as a team and try and hone in on Mr X. So I mentioned in the previous one of my previous 10 for this list I really enjoy teamwork. Well, this is a great example of it. Working together as a team in order to catch that one player who's functioning as Mr. X. So that's a hidden movement game. I'd like to see more of these that don't complicate the game, but maybe just, uh, you know, a clever twist on what happened in Scotland Yard all those years ago. Number 52 is Take That. Now, Take That is often hated by players. Players don't like take that very much. And I understand it, and I, I, I guess I don't in, in certain circumstances. So it's got to be used carefully and skillfully. But I really like it in games like Abyss and Bruges, where those are two examples of tableau building games, where I can choose to, to pick up cards and, and use strategies that uh, enhance my own powers and work on my own resources, gathering resources, um, you know, and, and just make me better and better at scoring points and things like that. Or I can choose to use the powers that directly knock back the other players, that take their stuff, that beat them down. And I mean, those games I feel get away with it because it's used sparingly and it's not particularly punishing. Um, and, and it's just those little delicious moments where you feel like you're being a little bit naughty because you're, you know, well, the other players are all playing quite nicely, but haha, they didn't know I was going to play this card. And there's, there's some fun in that, some vindictive fun in that. The problem is when it goes too far or when it can overturn an, a, a player's entire strategy. You know, in some games, if you play it, take that card in the middle of it and, okay, everything they've been working on for the last half hour or hour has been ruined, or maybe it's even lost them the game. That's extremely frustrating when those sort of things happen. In a super light game, then I can really get on board with Take That too. I can find it really fun to be playing cards back and forth, attacking each other, as long as the, you know, if the whole game is built around Take That, I can buy into it. I don't want it to drag on too long, and I think that's a problem with some of the, the mainstream versions of that, like, um, uh, for example, um, Flux or uh, Munchkin. Some of these games can drag on and on and on. But when it's kept short and simple, I think Take That can be a really funny, fun mechanism. It's, it's, it's fun to be vindictive once in a while um, when, when with friends who understand and aren't going to be hurt or offended by it. Number 51 is a variable interface. And what I mean by that is essentially it, it could be a modular board um, it could be a different, you know, a different board, different maps. For example, in Power Grid, you can buy all sorts of different maps for that game that change the way the game plays, the way it feels. In Kingdom Builder, you build your map by placing together four different boards and you can put them in different orientations. You can, you know, there's lots of different boards to choose from and so it creates a different layout of terrain that just changes the way you play the game each time. In Cartographers, they release map packs. Uh, they've, they've just started releasing these expansion map packs. Same thing happens in Welcome To. And these just change, although the core rules haven't changed, they just change the way you play the game slightly. And I think this is a great way of keeping games refreshing. Whether it comes in the, the main box or whether these are expansions, I don't really care. I just like the fact that a game can be refreshed um, without actually changing the core rules, just by provide, providing you with a different sort of playing space um, to, to, to get stuck into. So those are my numbers 60 to 51. And as we've done in previous videos, um, I'm now going to finish off by telling you one mechanism in a game that I really don't like. And that today is going to be pre-game auctions. Now I've previously talked in one of these videos about how I enjoy auctions. And I do. I like auctions in games. What I don't like is an auction right at the start. An auction to kind of determine we're bidding to see who gets to be that player, that role, uh, who gets to use that special ability, or 
uh, play at turn order. We're, we're bidding for who gets to go first or second or third. Um, I find that a, a, a clunky mechanism, an awkward mechanism. It's a, it's a mechanism that alienates new players because how are they to know what they're supposed to bid? They've never played the game before, so how are they supposed to decide how much they, it's worth to be first player or second player or third player or how much you know, it's worth to have that power over another power? I just think it's a, yeah, just a really awkward mechanism that is only there for experienced players, which means you're always going to have a really sort of dodgy first, second, third experience of playing that game, by which time you've probably most players have probably done with it. We've, with plenty of other games to play, they've probably moved on. So yeah, I'd like to see the end of pre-game auctions. Not my favourite mechanism <laughs> at all. I hope you enjoyed the video today. Let me know what you think of the mechanisms that we talked about. I mean, what do you think of Take That, for example? I bet a load of you out there hate it. And maybe some of you love it, love being vindictive. Let me know in the comments. I really like knowing your opinions. If you've never commented before, please stop by and say hello. If you're just visiting the channel for the first time, make sure you subscribe because there's going to be more and more videos like this over the coming days, weeks, months. <laughs> I've got loads of videos on my channel you can go back and watch as well. And I'll see you in a couple of days for the next instalment. All the best.